I believe that healing is super important. And I believe it's super important for a number of reasons. But one of the main reasons why is because it is a tangible representation of God's love on earth. It helps to strengthen us and to strengthen others. And it shows people that the gospel is not just of word, but of power. And I think it's an area where people have not seen God come through in their mind. And it's caused an immense amount of dissatisfaction and discontent and also caused a massive amount of faith to build and hope to build for people. So it's it's caused a lot of blessing and a lot of disappointment. Um, but, but I want you to understand that it's not healing in and of itself. It's our application and our understanding of healing. And so that's the reason I want to share with you in an exhaustive way uh, so that you have a real good basis for why you believe what you believe about healing. I want to start off by saying that I don't know everything there is to know about healing. Okay. I just don't. There are things that I'm learning all the time. There are angles to it. There are nuances to it. But I will say that it's one of the areas of my life where I've seen the biggest level of success that you could measure outwardly. Okay. Uh, God's changed me far more internally than you'll ever see on the outside. Uh, because oftentimes, you know, there's a delayed process in implementing what you learn on the inside than what you see on the outside. But as far as healing is concerned, um, it's just an area that I would consider an area of strength for me. And like I said, I don't know everything about it. I'm not perfect. Um, there are questions that you'll ask me that I'll just say, I don't know. Um, there are questions that you'll ask me, that I can give you an opinion. And, and that opinion is based on experience or some level of knowledge, but it's not going to, it's not going to satisfy you. Okay. And so, um, so like I said, uh, I don't know everything there is to know, but I know enough to be confident to step into a room and be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And I've been able to do that all over the world. And it's just really, really cool. And I want you to have the same thing that I've experienced where you see that God is not just words, but that there's a tangible representation of his goodness. And, uh, and the first thing that I would ask you to do is to kind of put away some preconceived notions and some preconceived uh, or, or previous beliefs about God and about healing and about the way it works. I will tell you that when I started down this rabbit hole, so to speak, um, it really took me places that I didn't, I didn't think were, uh, were were godly or correct or possible. And a lot of that had to do with my background and my level of belief and my lack of understanding. And some of it was just the resistance, you know. And so tonight, my focus is really going to be on giving you a context so that as I get into the word, you understand where I've come from and you understand why I'm so strong on it and why I believe what I believe. And hopefully some of these will touch on maybe your experiences and the things that you've seen. And so the first uh, kind of brush or the first experience that I had with healing uh, happened around 20, uh, probably around 2010. It's 2009, 2010, something like that, uh, where I personally experienced it. And the challenge that I always had with healing is, you know, I come from a banking background and, and bankers uh, are very analytical and and not just that, but also come from a former communist country, right? And so when, you, when you're an analytical ex-communist country living banker, you become super aware of people and super aware of, um, I don't know what's the word, but people lying to you, you know, you, you become aware of people uh, misrepresenting, of people embellishing, you know, and, and I found that like when you're a banker, people, you know, let's say you're lending them money, right? They're going to tell you all sorts of stuff. Oh, yeah, I work here. I work there. I get money from here. My expenses are really low. My income's really high. Everything's fantastic. This is a great deal. And you have to be able to sniff those things out, you know? And when you live in an ex-communist country where kind of, you know, your neighbors could inform on you, uh, you know, if you said anything against the government or if you're in a situation where you had something that they didn't have, you had to pretend to, to be poorer than you were or more struggling than you were because people would look at you and say, well, how come you've got something your neighbor doesn't? So you, you become very skeptical about what you're told and what you hear. And then along with all that, if you're just an analytical person, and some of you may be this way, if you're a very, very analytical person, you've seen chinks in the armor of um, explanations and stories and you start to get a skeptical viewpoint. And especially if you've been to church for years and years and years and never really saw anything, that adds an additional religious layer, I would call it, of, of analysis and skepticism. So you've got baseline skepticism because you're brought up in a communist country. Then you've got additional skepticism because you work in a banking environment and, and a kind of a business environment where people are constantly trying to kind of lie and misrepresent. 
And then on top of all of that, you've got a, a, a layer of religious uh, skepticism because you grew up in a church environment where you never really saw God do anything. You saw people wailing and crying and asking God. You saw people die. You saw people get sick. You saw people go through all this stuff. And you hear things, um, but you never see it, right? And so you fast forward all of that to, to kind of 2009. And my first personal real brush with, with healing was with our children. So we had Joshua and uh, my wife and I struggled to, to have uh, Joshua. And some of you have heard this story, but, but you know, we struggled to have Joshua. Um, you know, Naomi had some str struggles conceiving. And we got prayer at the local church. And it was funny because it was a Baptist church, right? But there was this guy, his name was Mike. And um, we didn't know anything about this stuff, right? We hadn't listened to Andrew. We hadn't listened to any of this sort of faith healing stuff. All we'd really done is just gone to this Baptist church. And we turn up to this church and uh, we go to the front and we hear that, people want prayer they can go to the front so we go to this guy mike and he said something so weird right so weird again to my analytical mind he said um now you got to be careful because if i pray people get pregnant and i was like what are you talking about like who talks that way i mean again if you come from a church where nothing happens like who talks that way who has confidence that uh, that something is going to happen in uh, in a church context like church is always kind of say, well, you know, if it God will, if it be God's will, if God will allow, if we, you know, we'll all lift up this brother or sister to you. And for this guy, he had such a confidence, you know, and so we prayed with him. And nine months later, now he gets pregnant, and we have Joshua. And so that was kind of weird. But I put it to the side and just went, okay, well, you know, maybe, right? You never, you never think that God can't do it. You just go, the Lord works in mysterious ways. It's the way that everyone talks about it. You know, it's just, it's such a catch-all for God. You know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. We don't really know. We kind of ask him. He's like a, he's like a, uh, like a slot machine. You know, you put the coin in and you pull the thing. And if something comes out fantastic, but you're not really expecting it, right? That's the reason you're not putting all of your money into the slot machine. You just put in a couple of, you know, a couple of cents, maybe a dollar or two, because you're not really expecting to win. But if you win, fantastic right and that's how people treat healing that's how people treat a lot of the supernatural things in many of our churches it's you know we'll throw a prayer out there and if god if it just happens that god's you know spiritual slot machine you know if your number comes up then you get your healing but we don't really know what's going to happen we don't really know how this stuff works and for me that was a really terrible way to represent god but i didn't know any better and so that's what i thought happened when this guy mike prayed for us then we go through this period of, of, um, of you know, seeing Joshua uh, be born. And then we want to try for our second, for our daughter. And in between Joshua and Elizabeth, who's our daughter, uh, we had two miscarriages. And when we had, went through these two miscarriages, that's really the process that got us on this journey. And the first time when we had the first miscarriage, you know, Naomi was just starting to get on this understanding of faith and healing and how it all works. Uh, but she wasn't really fully baked, so to speak, right? She, she had a level of understanding. I was not interested. I wasn't interested. I was going to work. My career was the most important thing to me. I didn't really focus on any of this stuff. But in the background, Naomi's learning and growing. And as she's learning and growing, she's getting established in the word, but she wasn't fully there. She didn't really fully believe it. Uh, but she kind of threw prayers out there and, and hoped that it would work. And so then we have this miscarriage and she's shocked. And she's shocked because if you have, you have to understand, Naomi was a goody two shoes. She still is a goody two shoes, but she was a really super goody two shoes. If you could have three shoes that were good, that would be Naomi. She'd be a goody three shoes, right? Like Naomi was good. You know, she never kissed a boy before. She, you know, she never held hands with a boy. You know, when we got married, she was a virgin. You know, all those things. She didn't swear. She didn't cuss. She didn't do all those things. She, she, you know, she didn't smoke. She didn't drink. She was a boring person right now but she was good right she was holy she was speaking in tongues she was born again all the things that would make you worthy to receive healing all the things that would make you deserve to be healed she had it all right fine she had a reprobate husband that didn't care and wasn't a particularly good christian but she she was fantastic right she had kept herself pure for her marriage she kept her mouth pure she kept her heart pure you know she kept all those things that uh, those other people in the bible that you might have read about you know the tithe of um, you know all their herbs and spices and kept all the laws and kept the cup really clean on the outside right she was one of those people 
You know, Naomi was a Pharisee. And I don't say that. She'll tell you that. You know, I don't say that in a, in a negative way. I'm sharing this with you so you understand the context of where we're coming from. So, so she was a Pharisee. She was a good person. And the fact that God would allow for this baby to die in her womb when she'd done nothing wrong, when she was seeking him, when she was speaking in tongues and she was praying and, you know, she was married. She wasn't having kids out of wedlock. She wasn't doing any of those. Like there was no reason outwardly why this baby should die. And in her mind, it was, this was not just unfair, but this was like a, 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 almost like an insult from God. Why would God do this to her? She felt like God took away something that she deserved because on the outward, uh, you know, she, she did everything right. And so we go through this first miscarriage. And then as she's learning and growing in the word, we go through the second miscarriage. And now she's really shattered because she doesn't understand. Because by this stage, she's understood that healing is from the Lord, that none will miscarry or be barren, that there's all these promises of God. And she's applying the verses and she's speaking those things. And she's, she's, she's waiting and expecting. And she goes through the same thing. And at about, I think it was about 20 weeks, uh, something like that. I can't remember exactly, but, um, but you know, the other baby dies as well. How does that work? I mean, how does it work when you're sincerely crying out to the Lord and you love him and you seek him and you want this thing from the deepest part of your heart and you've already lost one baby? You struggled to get your first one and then he granted your wish so you know that it's possible. And then you lose the second. Like God is so arbitrary. Like he just kind of picks and chooses. Like, is he having a bad day? And fine, you know what, God, you, you let this one baby die, but why would you let my second die? Especially as I'm, and you know, I have to understand by this point, Naomi was listening, listening to Bible teachings and reading her word and, and praying and all the rest of it, like eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Like literally, she, her full time job was listening to the word and obviously caring for Joshua. And God allows this second baby to die. And it's like, what is going on? And so she's distraught. She's pretty shattered. Again, I'm very aloof. I'm still at work. I'm still, you know, I mean, I'm aware of what's going on, but guys just don't feel what women feel, you know, when they go through this stuff, uh, not to the same degree anyway. And so she's quite alone, you know, and so she's crying out to God. And imagine just in her mind, you know, as, as a young, you know, as a young lady, she's truly really struggling with this stuff. And then we go through the third pregnancy. And we get to a point where it's, I think, week 12 or 13. And without getting too graphic, you know, she goes to the bathroom and sees the same sort of stuff. She sees like, you know, kind of chunks of things in the, in the toilet. So it's just, it looks exactly the same as the other two. And I remember going with Naomi to the doctor and sitting in the doctor's office with her. It was around 12 weeks, 12, 13 weeks. I don't know exactly, but it was, it was early on. And the doctor said to her, basically, look, you're going to, you know, you're probably going to lose this one as well. The symptoms are exactly the same. You have all these issues and so on, just health issues. And so you're probably going to lose this one as well. And I remember now you're just looking, looking at the doctor and she's like, no, it's going to be okay this one. And I thought that she'd gone crazy. I thought that she had lost her mind because I'd seen how many tears she had shed up until this point, um, you know, on this journey of basically getting pregnant twice and losing the baby. And now it looking the same. And I literally thought she had lost her mind. And we walked out of that doctor's office and she's like, no, my baby's going to live and all the rest of it. And she's shared this on, 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 on YouTube, on our channel. So if you haven't watched it, you can go back and watch her testimony around pregnancy and that. Um, but, but I thought she lost her mind. And, and that's because I wasn't connected into her world and what she was learning and what she was uh, submitting herself to in the word. And, and Naomi hadn't gone crazy. What she had done is she had started to understand not just in her head, but in her heart, she had a ream of word that this baby was going to live and not die. And so all she did was she declared, like it says that God declares those things which are not as though they were. The truth is that this baby was exhibiting all the same signs and symptoms of a miscarriage. But Naomi was able to go beyond her feelings, beyond her fears, beyond what she saw in her physical body. And she was able to call this thing alive and not dead and we had elizabeth and naomi didn't like the name elizabeth i always liked the name elizabeth right it was my favorite i want my son to be william and my daughter to be elizabeth why i don't know maybe i like the queen but it's just i always liked those names she didn't like elizabeth right but it's so weird so so when when we get through this process god talks to naomi 
and says to her, this is my promise to you. And when Naomi looks up the word promise of God, it's the word or the name Elizabeth. And so it's so cool that I always wanted to call my daughter Elizabeth. And that's also a promise of God. And so it's just such an amazing testimony of God's goodness, right? And so we go through all of this and I'm like, okay, so there's something to this healing thing. But understand, this is still happening in Naomi's body. I've not experienced anything. So I'm like, okay, it's kind of maybe real. And then Naomi's brother gets healed of something. And so I'm like, okay, so that's two people now that have been healed of something. But again, skeptical, analytical, right? Then you start watching stuff on TV. You go to different meetings. You see people get healed in the crowd. You're like, well, what if that person got, that looks like a setup. That guy probably knew that guy. I reckon the pastor bought that guy along. And look, there is a lot of that, right? There was a guy in Africa who bought a dead person. Like they went to a funeral that dead, right? The guy's like in his coffin. The guy like does his mumbo jumbo and the, the corpse rises from the dead and they're like, yay, this is amazing. And they find afterwards it was all planted and obviously it's fake, you know? And so when you hear this stuff and you hear of shady preachers and then they're asking for money and then all this stuff, right? Naturally you get skeptical. And so as the circle gets closer and closer to me where it's like, I hear about people and then it's like, well, I respect those people, but you know, I'm really not sure. And then, you know, okay, well, that's someone that I kind of peripherally know. And then, you know, maybe that's okay and then it gets closer and closer and now it's within my family and people that I know and then it happened to me and so we were driving one day I used to suffer, suffer with really bad hay fever like shocking hay fever and once a year every year uh, I would have to take about a week to two weeks off work and I would have literally two tissue boxes next to me and I would be blowing my nose all day and my eyes would water and there was just no way uh, for me to function. I just literally would just, I was a mess. And I tried everything. I did all the over-the-counter stuff, Claritine, Zyrtec, you know, just everything. I got onto Rhino Court, which was like the next one was like a prescription medicine. You know, some of you may have taken that, you're putting your nose. It, you know, anything around nose stuff is actually really rude, right? If you've got issues with your nose and you got to get plastic surgery, you know what it's called? Rhinoplasty. Rhinoplasty. Why would they use the word rhino if you're already self-conscious about your nose? The worst thing you could call someone is something to do with rhino if they really feel bad about their nose. Rhinoplasty and rhino court because you've got problems with your nose. It's like the worst thing ever. Sometimes the medical community is just taking the mickey out of us. But anyway, we're driving to church one day and uh, it was a church we didn't really attend often, but this um, this preacher was pretty full of the Holy Spirit, but, but we didn't attend his church up. And I remember we're driving there and we're only like five minute drive, five, six minute drive from the church, from our house to the church. And halfway, literally within two or three minutes, I had to pull the car to blow my nose because that's how bad, uh, that's how bad my nose was watering. And so we pull into the church car park and I said, Naomi, just go inside and I'm just going to go to the, the pharmacy and see if I can just get something, like just get something for my nose. And she's like, why don't you just come inside church and just come and sit in the back? And so I'm sitting in the back of the church and like, whatever. And they're, they're singing up the front. And some of you may have heard me share this before, but, but you know, understand, like, I feel terrible. I'm not full of faith. I'm not expecting anything. I'm not believing for anything. I'm just sitting at the back of the church because I can't do anything else. And as I'm sitting at the church and my eyes are just wet and my nose is wet and I'm just, I feel horrible. I hear the voice of God say, go and sing up the front, like not on the stage, but just go towards the front of the church and sing. And I can't sing. I'm, I'm a terrible singer. Um, but I'm like, fine. And I just go. And, and again, understand the reason I'm sharing this with you is because you have to get past the preconceived ideas and the preconceived notions um, the same way that, that I had, if you're going to really excel and grow in this area. So I go to the front of the church and if you picture like, let's say that this is the church, you know, say the church is like this and this is the back of the church and then this is the stage and I'm just here on the side, right? Near the, kind of near the stage, but, but on the side here. And I remember the band was playing and I just kind of had my hands out like this and, uh, and God just tells me to sing and I'm just singing along. And as I'm singing, I just feel the presence of the Lord and my nose just dries up like that but didn't just dry up in the sense of like you know you wiped your nose but you still feel it but but my nose dried from the like from the outside in you know if you've ever gone into a sauna if you've been in a dry sauna and you start to breathe in and it's like it just clears you right out you feel like you know like a straw sucked you from the inside it's kind of like that 
my nose completely dried up, my eyes dried up, and it was like you turned a tap off. I was just dry. And I'm sitting there with my eyes closed and I'm just asking the Lord, I'm like, what is going on? Because this has never happened before. And God spoke to me and he said, he said, God inhabits the praises of his people. It's a Bible verse, right? God inhabits the praises of his people. And then he said, where, where God is, sickness cannot stand in the presence of God. And that's what he spoke to me. And from that moment, I got healed of all of my issues as far as hay fever and all that stuff. And I've never had it again from that moment. And that was, a, that was a word for me from the Lord that, number one, God inhabits the praises of his people. That's the reason why he told me to get up from that back row and go and praise him, you know, near the stage to just, just be praising him. And then he told me that in his presence, sickness cannot stand. And I was like, wow. So that taught me two things. The first thing it taught me is God is a good God, but he's not going to work independently of you. You know, people oftentimes lay blame at God's feet because they think that he can do anything, but he chooses to do nothing. And in the area of healing, it's such a, it's such a problem for people because, again, it's a tangible thing. It's something that people see. It's something that people feel. They have pain. They have issues. They're, they're struggling with sickness, with disease, with, with all sorts of problems. I mean, parents will see children die. Children will see parents die. Loved ones die. And they're crying out to God. And God is allowing those things to happen in their mind. How do you square that circle? How do you deal with the fact that you see God has this immense power over here and does all these really cool things and comes through for these people, but he doesn't come through for you? And one of the things that I learned that day is that if I didn't get up off that back seat, and if I, when I heard the voice of God, if I didn't get up and go out the front, I don't believe that I would receive my healing. And it's not because God didn't want me to receive my healing, but I had to do something in order to get that to happen because he wanted me to worship him so that he could inhabit those praises Right. And so I, I was able to cooperate with God and receive that healing. But it's like, why did God do it that way? I don't know why he did it that way, but that's the way he chose to do it. And one of the weeks I'm going to spend talking about all the way that Jesus healed. If you look at the way Jesus healed, he healed different ways all the time. Sometimes he spoke, sometimes he touched, sometimes he put spit on somebody's eyes. Like, can you imagine how dumb, this is dumb, okay? This is dumb. Why would you, to someone that's blind, why would you spit on the ground, get mud, and then put it on their eyes in order for them to see? Like, imagine if you heard the voice of the Lord say, okay, that person's got knee problems. I want you to get this baseball bat, and I want, to hit, I want you to hit them as hard as you can in the knees with this baseball bat, because that's going to heal them. Like, who would be willing to do that? Like nobody, because it sounds dumb. Why would you hurt someone's knees when they've got knee problems? In the same way, if someone's blind, why would you put mud in their eyes? Like of all the things that's going to make it harder for them to see. But see, God doesn't operate the way that we operate. And so you have to get past this idea that God's going to do things the way that you want him to do it and in the way that you want him to do it. And I've just learned along the way that God uses different methods to heal people. And Jesus shows us so many different ways and the disciples show us different ways. And so as I'm going to be teaching on the topic of healing, I want you to understand that I'm going to give you a biblical representation of healing, not a, not a religious view. And some of this is going to contradict maybe what your church teaches. Some of this is maybe going to contradict what some of your favorite preachers um, teach. But I want to tell you that um, the stuff that I'm sharing with you has borne a lot of fruit in my life. Again, I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not saying that we know everything there is to know. I can just tell you that it works and it's getting better all the time. And so, you know, to the degree that I can share that with you and that helps you, fantastic. And then I hope that you build on that and grow from there. But I want you to understand that I didn't come from a happy, clappy Christian background. I didn't come from a faith-believing background. I had to overcome a lot of skepticism, a lot of unbelief. And I still, I was very much the doubting Thomas. Like, you know what, God, I don't care if anybody else gets healed. Until it happens to me, I will not believe. And God was so good that he showed me his goodness in that moment where I wasn't seeking him. I wasn't believing him. And so he heals me. He heals me of this hay fever problem. And that rocked my world and turned it upside down. And the reason why I'm so strong on healing is because my life was going in this direction. But after that moment, my life changed because I was confronted with an actual 
real healing that happened to me, to nobody else, to something that had been plaguing me for years. It's not something that, you know, I had a little bit of back pain and it went away and you could kind of go, oh, well, you know, maybe you just sat funny or, you know, whatever. It's like, listen, I've been to all the doctors. I went to all the specialists, you know, I was on all the drugs. Like I had tried everything. I was like that woman, you know, in the Bible where she had the issue of blood and she just kept getting worse. It was just worse every year. And the -the over-the-counter stuff didn't work. And, you know, there was surgeries and things you could do. There was just, it's just, it, it got worse and it was debilitating. And so the fact that I could be supernaturally healed in an instant, I was like, God, are you real? Like, are you real, real? Like, not just kind of real, but like really, real, real, like real, real? Because if you are, I can't live my life the same way anymore. I just, I can't, I can't, I can't just be a banker or I can't just be a whatever. I can't, I mean, it's not about not working, but it's like, I just, I, I can't make Everything that was the focus of my life up until that point changed because I recognized that God was real, 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 right? In a way that I'd never experienced him before. That if God was willing to get so personal in my life, and again, I'm not seeking God, I'm not really trying, I'm not really doing anything, and he's willing to do that for me, I've got to figure out who this God is. And that's what took us on the journey of going to Bible college and everything else, you know, is we just decided that we're not going to do life for ourselves anymore. We're going to pursue this God that is real. And and that's why healing is such a big deal for me because it changed my life. Of course, the gospel changes your life and all of that. But for me personally, for me, being supernaturally healed of that, it changed my life. And so then I started, you know, listening to everything I could on healing. And all of that got me to the point where I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I've shared this with you guys before, I'm sure. But, you know, one night I was just like, you know, we were doing a Bible study at our house and uh, my wife was there and a couple of other people, my brother-in-law. And um, I just said, I-, I want the Holy Spirit. And I won't go through the whole story, but, you know, I just prayed and and eventually I received the Holy Spirit. I started speaking in tongues. And then that just flicked the switch on the inside of me. And I've never been the same since. And that's really what empowered me. And I believe empowers every believer to be able to perform the miracles that God called us to perform and 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 to do those things because the spirit is actually what empowers us it's not of our own and so i want to say that the first thing when you're starting in this journey of 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 praying for others and 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 seeing the sick healed it's number one is you have to have your own personal revelation of healing i'm not saying you have to be healed yourself but i'm saying you have to have your own personal revelation of healing and you have to be obviously born again but you have to be filled with the spirit if you're going around trying to minister healing to people without being filled with the spirit you're doing it wrong And I'm not saying that you maybe will never see anything happen because I believe God's such a good God that he may even bridge the gap for you. But I can tell you that my results, uh, there was, there was was two, two things that really changed the results that I saw in healing. The first one was being filled with the spirit. You know, that really kind of, you know, I didn't really pray for many people before that, but I may have prayed for some, uh, very, very little, but that was the first step change. And the second step change is one that I'm going to talk about in a few weeks when we get there. But that's a belief that really held me back. And and it's a belief that you may have. And I'm going to absolutely destroy that belief in you. uh, And that's going to set you free because that's something that really, really held me back in the area of praying for people for healing. And uh, I believe that many of you are probably held back by the same thing. Uh, But it really held me back. So I'll share that with you in the coming weeks. But, uh, But once I got, once I got filled with the spirit, I just, my eyes were opened and I just saw the world in a different light and I couldn't shut up about Jesus. I couldn't stop but share all the friends I had, everyone that I knew, I just wanted to share with them about the goodness of God. And I didn't have to be forced. I didn't have to be pushed. I didn't have to be, you know, I wanted to do it. And so in starting to pray for people for healing, I did what everybody does, which is I got super self-conscious And I started to think about me and how it affects me and how it will look if I failed miserably. And again, I'm sharing with you from the heart because as we go on this journey and, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to share with you guys each week, but I want you to go out and do it. You know, I want you to go and lay hands on the sick and you're going to be surprised at what happens. And so initially I was like, all right, I'm going to have to start praying for people for healing freely received, freely give. So I'm like, who can I pray for and not be embarrassed? And at the time, my kids were like one and three. And so it was great because they couldn't really speak. And so there was no one they could tell. And so I could pray for them. And it was fantastic. So I started praying 
for my kids. So if they fell over, I would pray for them. And the first healing that I remember, the first, first one that I remember, and there was some before this, but the first one I remember was we were in our kitchen in Townsville. And uh, I remember Joshua running across the room and he was just wearing a nappy. He was, like I said, about three years old. And he's wearing a nappy because Townsville is like a million degrees and 100% humidity. So you just, you don't really wear clothing. This is why, for those of you that are in Queensland, we understand now why clothing is optional and shoes are optional. It's just so hot all the time, right? Um, even now when my brother-in-law comes down, he lives on the Gold Coast, he comes down here, it's like five degrees outside, they're wearing shorts. Like, what are you doing wearing shorts? It's like, in them, it's like perpetual summer, right? It's always warm. But, um, but he comes running up to me and he's screaming and he's holding his ears like this. He's just screaming and holding his ears. And I didn't know what happened. I didn't know if he'd hurt himself, if he'd punctured an eardrum or whatever. Um, and I picked him up and I'm looking for my keys. I'm looking around the house for my keys and I can't find my keys And because I want to rush him to the hospital. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, why don't you just pray for him? I didn't think about praying for him in that moment. I just thought, what is going on in my son? And so I was like, all right. So I just put him down and I put my hands over his hands. So like that, I put my hands over his hands. And I just said, pain, go in Jesus name, ears be healed. And he just, Joshua just looks at me like this, puts his hands down and then just runs off in place like nothing happened. And I was more shocked than he was because I wasn't expecting anything. I wasn't expecting God to come through for me in that way. I was just obedient to that same voice that I heard in that church. And, you know, you can sometimes know all the stuff and yet your initial reaction is to go into human mode and, and into leaning on our own understanding because we haven't trained ourselves to go to God instead of to go to the spirit, uh, instead of to go to pe people or to go to man. Even though I'd seen healing and I'd experienced that and all the rest of it, my initial thing when my kid is suffering was that I was going to go and I was going to take him to the doctor. Now, let me just say something. There is nothing wrong with going to the doctor. I know people have this issue. They have this hang-up. I'm going to be very uh, black and white on some things. And then you can tell me later on that I should be gray. And I can hear Naomi already frowning from upstairs. I don't know that she is, but I'm assuming she is, right? Because this is how people are. I like to be black and white because I believe the Bible is very black and white. But God's best, okay? God's best is supernatural healing every time. That's God's best. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. I believe that that is 100% God's best. I don't see anywhere where Jesus sent someone to the doctor. I don't see anywhere where that's the best. Now, is it wrong for you to go to the doctor? No, it's not. Is it wrong for you to take medicine? No, it's wrong. No, it's not. Is it wrong for you to have surgery? No, it's not. It's not wrong to do any of those things. Is it God's best? No, it's not God's best. But listen, God would much rather you be alive and learn and grow than you be stubborn and die trying to prove that you believe something you don't believe. One of the questions that you get asked a lot when you, when you minister to people on healing is like, you know, can I stop taking my medicine for my whatever disease? You know, it's like, if you have to ask the question, the answer is no, you should keep taking your medicine right? Because what people do is they get a hold of this teaching, they get excited about this stuff, and they think that by them stopping taking their medicine, it's a faith step. It's not, right? I had someone ask me once, you know, they were praying for their vision, you know, they had glasses, and um, they didn't have good vision, I took their glasses off, and you know, things were blurry. And, um, you know, they asked us to pray for them for their vision. And they were like, you know, can I drive home like this without my glasses? I'm like, well, can you see well? They're like, no, like, then no, put your glasses back on. You don't drive with blurry vision. You're going to kill yourself and others. Like, how do you know when you no longer need glasses? When you put the glasses on and your vision is blurry, whereas it was clear before. That's how you know. Now, if, if God speaks to you and tells you, you know, that's different, but you will know you don't need glasses when you don't need glasses, Right? Now, that doesn't mean that we walk by, by sight and not by faith. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that you not wearing glasses when you're obviously unable to see clearly is not a way of you walking out your faith in the same way that if you need certain pills to keep you going, because that's what your body needs right now, you don't stop taking them in the hope that that's going to somehow manifest your healing. When you're healed, you will not die if you stop taking your meds. But if you're not healed, 
you will die, right? Because that's the reason you take meds in the first place. And this is the first sacred cow. And I'm only going to kill one tonight. But this is the first sacred cow that I think you have to kill in your mind. And I don't know how to say this the right way because I know it's going to offend some of you. And if you're watching this afterwards, even better because you can't see me. Oh, well, you can see me, but I can't see you. I can see some of the people on. But you know how it says that you're already healed? You know, people say that you've already been healed. I'm sorry, you haven't. You haven't already been healed. You haven't. Okay? People say, oh, you've, oh, I've already been healed. No, you haven't. And it's really clear that you haven't for a couple of reasons. Number one, someone will come to you and say, oh, brother, can you please pray for me? And you say, oh, yeah, sure. What do we need to pray for? And then they're stuck because if they believe that they've already been healed, now anything they say about a condition they want you to pray for is a negative confession. So now they've checkmated themselves spiritually. They don't know what to do because they can't tell you they have cancer or sickness or pain in their body because they believe that that's a negative confession. But then at the same time, they'd like to be free of it. So they'd like you to pray with them, but they can't name the thing. And it's this Christian voodoo where if we say the word cancer, somehow cancer is going to jump on us and make it worse. Or if we say I have this problem or this sickness or this disease, listen, you not being able to say what you physically have in your body says that that thing has power over you. You have allowed that thing to scare you. And that's why you can't say that word. I've heard people say the C word. They won't say cancer. They'll say, oh, you know, I have a diagnosis of the C word. When you say that, that means that you are afraid of cancer. Let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. When did Jesus die for us? 2,000 years ago, amen? When did Jesus take the stripes on his back for our healing? 2,000 years ago. He's not getting back on the cross, Yeah in order to, to atone for our sins, like he's not getting back on the cross. Guess what? He's also not getting whipped anymore. He's done with the beatings. He's done with the whipping. He's done with the crown of thorns. He's done with all that stuff. He's done with taking all of our sickness and disease upon his body, like it tells us in Isaiah 53. He's already done all that for us, but he did it 2,000 years ago. And you know, healing, and I'm going to show you this, healing is a birthright for you. Healing is not something that you need to request. It's something that you claim as a birthright. I'm going to show you the biblical basis for you claiming healing, not as a request, but something that you're owed. And I'm also going to show you why it doesn't happen automatically, right? I'm going to, I'm going to give you everything you need to know. But the point I'm making is Jesus died for our sins 2,000 years ago, the same way that he died for our healing 2,000 years ago. But let me ask you this. Is healing available for everyone? Yeah. But does everyone receive their healing? No. Because guess what? Healing is the same as salvation. It was all part of the package. So if you're saying that you already healed, that everyone's already healed, well, then you should also say that everyone is already saved. And yet we know that not everybody is saved. We know that people have to get saved. Now, do they have to do anything for salvation in the sense of earning it? No, Jesus already provided it for us. But you have to put faith in him and you have to, you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and you have to take him on as your Lord and Savior in order for that salvation to take any effect in your life, even though it was provided 2,000 years ago. So the same way that we don't say that everyone is already saved, it is scripturally incorrect to say that everyone is already healed. You're not already healed. Healing is available to you. It was already provided for you, but you need to take it and have it manifest in your body and in your life the same way that you have to take and manifest salvation in your life. You can die and go to hell even though Jesus provided salvation for you, and you can be sick even though Jesus provided healing for you. And the problem with telling people that they've already been healed is that now they become all introspective and they're thinking, what am I doing wrong? If I've already been healed, then why am I seeing it? Maybe I'm not holy enough. Maybe I'm not praying the right way. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm. And it's like, no, that's not, not nothing to do with that. You just, you just don't know how to get it to manifest in your life. And so the, the, the thing that I want you to get away from is this mindset that you've already been healed because it's scripturally incorrect. Because if you've already been healed, then why are you still dealing with that thing? And now you have to play these fake mental gymnastics with yourself, spiritual gymnastics to convince yourself that you've already been healed, but at the same time, your body hasn't figured it out yet and you have to grow in some area. It's like, come on. 
if everybody was already healed, then we wouldn't even be talking about healing. And this is where I believe sometimes the church does people a, 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 a um, what's the word? A dis something. I can't remember the word right now. Uh, but it's not a good thing because they 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 make these statements and then they're trying to justify it in a way that is not spiritually accurate or not biblically accurate, I should say. You know. And so we've got to be serious about this and, and call it what it is. You know, if you've just come back from the doctor and the doctor has diagnosed you with cancer, you have cancer. Yeah, there you go, Sean, disservice. Yeah, the church does us a disservice sometimes, right? If the, if the doctor tells you that you have cancer, guess what? You have cancer, unless the diagnosis is wrong. And the problem is that when we hear that, we go, no, 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 I don't have cancer. No, you do. You have cancer. That's the reason you went to the doctor because you're probably feeling sick. That's the reason when the doctor did the diagnosis, the diagnosis was that you have cancer. Just that people fall apart accepting that truth. That is the truth. You have cancer. Just the same way that if you went to the doctor and you had, you know, they have to amputate your arm. You're not like, oh, no, no, I still have an arm. It's like, oh, we'll pick up a coffee cup. You can't, you don't have an arm, right? So that's just, that's the reality. And, and because we get into these Christian gymnastics in our mind and we have to kind of square the circle, it actually hurts our heart and puts a wedge between us and God and the scripture. Because we don't want to teach people how to get healed. We don't want to teach people how this stuff works. We just want to pat their head and, and make them feel better. But if you're going to really disciple people, you have to get into the depths of the word and, and be real with them, you know? And so if someone has cancer, this is the approach. Hey, you know what? You have cancer because that's what the doctor told you. And that's what the diagnosis shows. In your physical body, you have cancer. But you know, God can overcome cancer. And we're going to believe with you. And we're going to pray for you. We're going to see that cancer go in Jesus' name. And you're going to be free of cancer. And you're going to rub the devil's nose in it. And it's going to be an amazing testimony. Praise Jesus. But do you have cancer? Yeah, you do. Right? That's the reason we're praying for you, because you have cancer. Otherwise, why would we pray for you if you didn't have anything? And I know people, you know, close to me that struggle with this stuff, that they'll get a diagnosis for themselves or for someone else. And it's like they don't want to call it the diagnosis. All that says is you've given power to the diagnosis. And I'll show you where Jesus, Jesus himself, according to people, and I'll show you this. In the, in the word, right? Everything we do is scripture-based, right? I'll show you where Jesus speaks unbelief, right? He doesn't. But where if we did it in our Christian circles, we'd say Jesus is speaking unbelief. And he's not. He's just calling things matter-of-factly, but he knows. He knows that there is something stronger coming than what the diagnosis is in the moment. But you have to, the, the reason I'm sharing on this tonight is I need you to spend the next week getting all the junk out of your mind and out of your belief system around healing, that it's not a formula, that it's not a certain three-step process, that we can rely on God, that there is a way to see healing manifest, but it's not the way that we would always want it, in the way that we would want it, in the way that we've seen other people do it. Healing is very much a spirit-led thing, number one. And number two, it's always done under the basis of love. And so when we're approaching people for healing, it's not for a show. It's not for our own personal edification. It has to be driven by God's love for that person in that situation. And, and the way that you're going to manifest healing is by you personally having a deep conviction that God wants everyone to be well. You have to establish that God wants everybody to be well. If you have a shadow of a doubt that God maybe wants that person sick, it is impossible for you to pray for that person in any sort of faith because you just don't know. And you could be going against God. So you have to, number one, you have to have your own personal revelation of healing and how it works. And I'm going to give you that over the coming weeks. So, so well, I can't give you the revelation, but I can give you the information. Then you have to also have the baseline belief that everybody can be healed of anything at any time. You have to have the baseline belief that God's best is supernatural healing, but there is nothing wrong with going to the doctor because you'll condemn people, right? I'll tell you, so I got, I'll give you a classic example of this, right? Last year, uh, 20, yeah, 2022, we've traveled the world. I never get sick, right? Never, never get sick. 
travel the world during COVID in America, around the world, in 2021, around the world, countries and countries and countries. I'm speaking, I'm ministering, I'm all everywhere, right? For two years when COVID is rampant around the world, I don't get sick. I come back to Australia, the fortress of solitude, right? Superman would love it here, right? No COVID anywhere, you know, in the sense of compared to the rest of the world. And I get COVID in Melbourne, in my house within the five kilometer radius we're allowed to go on, right? And I am sick as a dog for two weeks. And so mind you, at this stage, right? At this stage of my life, I've seen a lady come out of a wheelchair. I've seen stage four cancer healed. The guy was going to die in three weeks. I prayed for him. He, he's clear of cancer. I've seen deaf ears open. I've seen just about every miracle that you can think of. And I'm sick in bed with COVID. And I'm talking to the Lord. And the Lord tells me, he says, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to heal you of this supernaturally. And he then gives me a sign that he's going to do it. He tells me, I'm in my living room, right? This is, I'm, I'm not kidding, right? I'm in my living room. And he tells me, he says, stand up and you're going to feel like a cool wind. You're going to feel really cool. And then after a couple of seconds, you're going to feel really hot, which is super weird because you're either going to feel cool or you're going to feel hot. You're not going to feel both. And so literally I stand up, mind you, I look crazy to anyone from the outside because I'm in my living room, in my robe, and I stand up and with my eyes closed and I just feel this cool wind and I'm cold for like three or four seconds. And then I feel just this heat and I'm like super hot. And it was amazing. And I'm like, this is incredible. And God did a bunch of other things in my heart as well, outside of kind of COVID, right? Um, just different things that I've been I've been asking him for and stuff. And, and it was a real amazing supernatural moment. And then I sit back down and I'm still sick. And I'm still sick that day and I'm still sick the next day. And I'm sick the day after that. And I don't know what to make of it. Because he told me he was going to heal me. And I stood up and had this experience exactly like he told me it would happen before it happened. I've never shared this with anyone. And, and yet I'm still sick. And about three days into it, I'm like, Lord, what is going on? I know you told me you'd heal me, but I feel like I'm dying. And he, you know what he said to me? He said, you need to go to the doctor. And I'm like, what? What do you mean I need to go to the doctor? You, you told me you would heal me. You gave me this experience, right? Like, why would I need to go to the doctor? And you know what he said to me? Because, because you're not believing me for your healing anymore. You've stopped believing me. You're saying all the right stuff, but in your heart, you want to go to the doctor. You're not believing me anymore. And I reflected on that and I went, yeah. Because you know what happened? I was expecting things to happen in my time frame. I believe that God's word was true for me. And that was that experience was not because the hot and cold thing was anything magical. It was more so God was encouraging me. But because my healing didn't manifest in that moment, it was hope deferred makes the heart sick. I was, you know, right? And I started to not continue to believe. And I'm like, well, maybe if not today, then maybe I might have to go to the doctor. And the next day I'm still sick. And then maybe I have to, right? And so eventually I go to the doctor and I get whatever she gave me, I don't know, some antibiotics or something. And, you know, a few days later after that, and I was good. And so, so here's the thing that I learned out of that. Number one, you can have an experience with the Lord. The Lord can speak to you. The Lord can tell you he's going to do something and you can still lose hope in that moment. You can still forget about it because we're human. Does that take away what the word says about healing? No. Does my experience always line up with the word? No. My experience doesn't always line up with the word. Does that change what the word says about healing? No. Does that change who God is? Absolutely not. Have I seen people healed since that time? Absolutely, lots. Can I explain to you everything about that experience? No, I can't. And God did some other stuff that's so cool, which I won't share tonight. But you know, during that that two week period, I was spending so much time just talking to the Lord. It was amazing, you know. And yet, in the midst of all of that, I was and 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 again, understanding that I'd come from a place of seeing so many people healed, you would think that I would have been able to hold on, so to speak, and keep my faith or whatever you want to call it right, for those extra few days, but I, I, I didn't, and because God loves me and wants me to be well, even though his best for me is for him to heal me, he would much rather me live, right, than die, and so it's much better for me to go to the doctor 
the not go at all. And so this is why I'm sharing with you, don't be condemned. If you are not seeing the manifestation of your healing, right? Talk to God about it. And if you have peace about going to the doctor, then go to the doctor. Don't be one of those people that dies in your living room, hoping to hope and hoping to believe, right? I'm not telling you that you shouldn't have faith in God because you absolutely should. And I started off by saying that God's best is supernatural. But sometimes we're not in a place where we're believing his best. Sometimes we're not in a place where we're going to believe long enough. Sometimes it takes time to see our healing manifest. And there's reasons for that. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to go through all of that. But this week, I wanted to kill those sacred cows uh, because you will not be able to accept some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you from the word unless you kill some of these sacred cows about how healing works, about how God manifests. You will sometimes just need to go to the doctor, not because God doesn't heal, not because God doesn't love you, just because you are not in a place to receive that thing. And it's not because God is withholding it. You're just not in a place to receive it. And when you understand how faith works, which again, I'll share with you in the coming weeks, you'll see there are a lot of times when you are doing everything right in your mind, and yet you won't seem to be receiving the healing. Like for Naomi, by, by her second miscarriage, she was doing everything right in her mind. But I asked her afterwards, I said, why do you think that the third time worked, but the second time didn't? And you know what she said? She said, the first time I was just getting started and I wanted to believe it, but I didn't really believe it. I was just kind of throwing the prayer out there because that's what I'd heard. By the second miscarriage, I believed it mentally and I'd heard all the stuff but I didn't believe it in my heart. It wasn't a rhema word for me. It wasn't alive. When I, when I was speaking those words, I wanted them to be true, but I didn't know that I know. You know, it wasn't a heart knowledge. It was just a head knowledge. And she said, the only difference between the second and the third wasn't really in the level of knowledge. She'd already heard all the stuff is that by the third, that knowledge from her head had dropped down into her heart and she just had a knowing. And it was just the knowing that she couldn't explain, but it was a piece that passes understanding. And that's what made the difference. Notice that through the first, the second, and the potential third, Jesus still had died 2,000 years ago. Jesus didn't get back on the cross for our baby. The only difference between us having two miscarriages versus three was Naomi getting a revelation in her heart of healing and being able to speak to that problem and believe for it. It had nothing to do with changes in her body because her body was still the same. It had nothing to do with changes in my body because the body was still the same. We were still conceiving. It had everything to do with her belief system because we did two of them and they didn't work. And the only change was in what she believed and how she believed it. And as sad as it is to go through those things, God turned it together for good. And we've been able to pray for tons of people and see them pregnant. Because now when we pray for people to get pregnant, we have a heart revelation that that is God's goodness for them. God wants them to be pregnant. God wants them to make babies because God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. But see, we couldn't have given you that if we hadn't have seen the third. If we had only seen the first two, we would have said, yeah, God's a good God. You know, maybe we've heard he's good, but, you know, maybe it works for other people and not for us. But when you go through that and you live it and you experience it, then you go, wow. So the only difference between that baby living and dying is my level of belief. And, you know, one of the responsibilities we have as believers, and this is not, I don't want to put this on you as a heavy burden, but you do have to be honest with yourself and realize this. And I, I really realize this is sometimes the difference between someone living and dying is you. Sometimes you're the only thing that stands between someone living and dying. Sometimes you're going to be the difference in that room. When you walk in the room, you're going to be the difference between a miracle or not. And it's going to have nothing to do with God. It's going to have to do with you because God works with us. And it is such a huge responsibility, but such an honor and privilege that God would put all of that power of the universe on the inside of us so that we can manifest him. I've walked into hospital rooms and I've been the difference in that hospital room. Not because of me personally, but because of what's on the inside of me. And I want you to have the same thing. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing. And I'm going to share so many testimonies with you over the coming weeks. But it's so cool that we can touch where Jesus would have touched before. We can be Jesus in that situation. We can manifest the goodness of God. 
But there is so much in our minds because of religion, because of experiences, because of what we've been told, because of what we believe, because of our analytical mind, because of all those things. And those things are the roadblock between you receiving for yourself and also administering healing to other people. And they're things that will stop you, not because it's God, it's because us, we are the problem. We are the problem. And so you have to get away from this mindset that it's God, that God's withholding, that God doesn't want to or whatever else. But, but understand that it's for us to attain, but it's, but it's his power. It's what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago, but it's our job to grab it and to manifest it. You know, I want to show you this. Some of you have seen this already. I want to show you this quick snippet of this uh, lady that shared a testimony with us. This is from the Philippines uh, from a couple of weeks ago. And so I want to share this with you quickly. And you may not be able to necessarily hear it all. I'm going to tell you what happened with this lady. Um, sometimes the videos aren't necessarily the best. Why can't I do this? Ah, the play button is hidden right behind the thing. There we go. Thank you, my work. And I asked him that I need build. And uh, because I have to be healthy and, and go back to my work again, and it is clear in my lower back. Um, actually, when I was sitting there, I'm a little bit restless because it pains me when I'm sitting down for a long time. And so I asked him to pray for me, and um, my lower my lower back I don't feel anything. But I told him when my doctor here, I said it's not yet done. done. It's still painful. Then he prayed again and he declared it that I feel she's saying I don't feel any pain right now. I'm not sure if you guys could hear that, but what she was saying is that she had pain in her lower back and then also in her upper back. And um, I prayed for her for her lower back and the pain went, but then she still had pain in the top part of her back, and then I had to pray again and then it went. So, you know, that's one of the topics that we're going to cover. You know, can you pray more than once? If you pray more than once, is that unbelief, right? Again, all these different things that people believe if you pray more than once. And there's people that you might listen to, ministers that you listen to on TV or you read their books or whatever they'll tell you. If you pray more than once, it's unbelief. I'm going to tell you it's not. I'm going to show you that Jesus did it more than once, right? But again, it's all these preconceived ideas. So I just encourage you over this next week, I just encourage you take some time to just think about what are the roadblocks in my mind that's going to prevent me from receiving the word, from being able to believe God at his word, and that are going to stop me from being able to be the difference in people's lives. Because this is one of the key areas that I believe really sets us apart from every other religion. Obviously, what we believe is different because we believe in, in, in Jesus. But what I'm saying is, you know, if I'm talking to a Muslim and I'm talking to him about, you know, the gospel, and I say, well, you know, this is what Jesus did. And he says, well, this is what Muhammad did, you know. And then I say, well, this is what God says. And he said, this is what Allah says. And, and we can go back and forth. And at the end of the day, it's his theory versus mine. But if he has pain in his body and I lay hands on him and he gets healed, now what? Where do we go now? Because now you've seen a physical manifestation of what I believe. And all you have is theory. I can debate with the Buddhist about whether there's an afterlife or not. But if God gives me a word of knowledge for them and I can share with them something that they know there is no other way, it's like, hmm, I can't do that. But you can. Why is that? And this is why the Bible says that the word is, that the gospel is not just of word, but of power. When we can manifest the supernatural to those around us, it shows them that there's a truth that transcends just the mind. And that's what sets us apart. It's not about showing off. It's not about trying to make people, you know, chase signs and wonders. But it is about showing them that God cares about them in their situation. And because we are not be warmed and filled gospel people, we are the warming and filling gospel people. One of those areas is healing. One of those areas is not just saying, well, I hope that God heals you. It's like, no, you know what? Let me lay hands on you. Let's believe God together. And so I want to give you that confidence. But that confidence comes, number one, from hearing, right? Faith comes by hearing. But then it comes from application. So I'm going to give you all the tools, all the knowledge. I'm going to share with you a ton of experiences over the coming weeks. But then it's going to be your responsibility to put that into action. And then we're going to share some of those
testimonies in this group to encourage you and to encourage each other as we pray for the sick and see them healed. And I tell you, it is, it is for me personally, it's been the most life-changing part of my, uh, other than obviously my relationship with God and, and that, but as far as what's just touched my heart is just seeing people healed because it's a way that I can show people that God is real without just words. And I want that for you. And God wants that for you. That's the reason he provided it. And if you look, it's the one thing that is tied into the gospel more than anything else. And I'll show you this in the Bible, but you all know it. Jesus sends out his disciples and he says what? He says, preach that the kingdom is near and heal the sick. Everywhere you go, preach the gospel, heal the sick. Heal the sick, preach the gospel. Why? Why not something else? It's really simple. Because... Tell them what's coming and then show them. Show them the goodness of God in a tangible, real way and then tell them. When they get healed, tell them what healed them. And when you preach to them, right, and you tell them this is the goodness of God and they're like, well, why should I believe you? Then show them, lay hands on them, right? It says in, in Acts, if you look, it says that God confirmed their word with signs and wonders following. Why? Why didn't you just leave people to say things? Because God's not like that. God wants people to experience his goodness. We don't do it to, to, to get people in that way, but we do it as a confirmation, as a manifestation of his goodness.